Good morning again. I'm glad you're all here. <laughs> That's the true statement. Uh, I want to say something. It's been really nice. I've had conversations with a few people, and I've gotten some really good feedback on this uh, sermon series. And I was kind of afraid that some of you might get bored. Oh, by the way, John, between me and the weather, you're not making lunch, buddy. Uh, <laughs> just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, I, I really thought that some of you might get bored with this content because it's, I know it's been more of a, a, a lecture sometimes. But, and I talked to somebody this morning. Um, some of you know who Jeff is, and Jeff had to go back to Texas this morning, and I was taking him to the airport, and he asked me what I was going to be preaching on today, and I said, uh, the book of Nehemiah, and he said, I can honestly say I've never opened the book of Nehemiah. Anybody else? Come on, be honest. Yeah, I kind of figured. That's okay. You're going to learn all about him today. Uh, might as well just jump that right out there now. I think it's important that we understand the circumstances under which these historical events took place. And I also find it interesting to know as much as we can about the people involved. And that's what we're going to learn about today. We're going to learn a lot about Nehemiah. Not because there's nothing else to talk about, but because the things that we're going to learn about him are things that we can apply to our lives that can make us better ambassadors for Christ. Like the rest of the biblical characters that we read about in the Old and New Testaments, Nehemiah has some unique qualities that we can all learn from. Maybe more than any other Old Testament book, it, it seems that his personality comes through. And that's a big deal when you think about it, because if you read the books of Daniel and the book of Isaiah, their personalities really come through. But this even more because this is written in the first person. He says, I did these things. I found these things out. I, I, I. Now, a lot of times we don't like it when people are drawing attention to themselves. Their eyes are too close together. But in this case, it's important because the fact that he's speaking in the first person, he was there. That gives more historical credit and credence to the story because he was involved in it. As I make my way through the message, my hope is that we're not only going to recognize his characteristics and that they're characteristics that reflect his respect and love for God and for his fellow man, but that we might also strive, like I said, to apply those things to our lives and to live in a way that makes an impact for the kingdom. First, I'm going to give you some background on what led to this message. If you've never uh, read the book of Nehemiah, which it is apparent that some of you have not, uh, the scholastic study of the book can be completely and totally confusing, I've found out recently, because there are so many differing opinions on certain things. They are not things that matter. They are things of opinion. What we know as facts are these things. In the years prior to Nehemiah writing this account, a majority of the Jewish people had been held in exile outside of Jerusalem. At the same time, much damage had been done to the wall surrounding the city of Jerusalem and the gates that allowed access into the city. In Old Testament times, that's a big deal because that's how you protected your city. That's how when people attack, the last form of defense is the wall around the city. And we know from reading his own words that when Nehemiah finds out about the condition of the wall, it makes him sad. Now, there are not a lot of places in Scripture where someone writes, I was sad. We know Jesus did, right? Because it says he wept over the city. But Nehemiah, in chapter 1, verse 4, says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
Again, I want you to notice that he's writing in the first person. He's not telling you about somebody else's experience. He's telling the reader about his own experiences. Moving on to verses 5 through 11 of chapter 1, it tells us what this man prayed for. In the month of Nisan, in the 12, 20th year of the king of Artaxerxes, I got it right this time. When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his, in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Just so you know, if you go read the book of Nehemiah, it never says how long it's going to take you. But it's apparent that the king's going to let him go. He works for the king. There's something else that's important to see in that exchange. In presenting his proposal to the king, this man who is responsible, he's the cup bearer to the king. He's got a good job. Must have been trustworthy. He's a visionary. He wants to go fix the wall. Those are good qualities to have as a human being. But his first resort, as it had been when he found out about the state of the walls in the first place, is to pray. It says, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. That's going to be important in a little bit. Then, since it appeared likely that the king would allow him to take on this task, if you read on in Nehemiah, he goes to even ask for more things from the king. He asked the king for royal letters, letters that in that time would have given him safe passage on his way to rebuild the wall and would also have encouraged the people who had the resources to rebuild the wall to become involved in the project. When I read that, and some of you will know what I'm talking about, I think of Marge Friedel and the bond program. Who knows about the bond program? Marge was very involved in getting people who had the resources to supply the resources for kingdom work. The king not only granted all those requests, but he also sent military personnel along as insurance. So once the plan's been approved, Nehemiah goes into action. I think it's interesting that his first act is to go inspect the wall and the gates to determine if this can be done at all. Because he really doesn't know. He knows he's not going to be able to do it by himself. And he really wants to see if it can be done at all. In the conclusion of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, where obviously our verse 16 is found, we see that the writer is a man of action and a man of cooperation and a man of motivation. Those are more key character traits of this man, Nehemiah. And those are character traits that if we possess them and we display them, union. We can have unity in the church when we're willing to work together. So in his motivational speaking, he started by explaining what needed to be done and then he inspired others to share 
in his vision. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 18 says, The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. Didn't take him much to convince them to become involved. Pay attention there, church. He gives God the glory for how far he's made it up to this point. It's the hand of God. It's not anything that he's done. Our verse 16, which says, this is another one of those which, if out of context, wouldn't mean anything. Beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, ruler of a half district of Bethzer, made repairs up to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool in the house of the heroes. Means nothing without context, right? That's part of a chapter that shows the author's ability to organize the rebuilding work. He has, if you read chapter 3, it lists all the people who are involved and what their part was. And just to avoid confusion, the Nehemiah that's mentioned there is not the Nehemiah who wrote the book. That's why it says, son of Asbuk. If you go back to the very first verse of the very first chapter of Nehemiah. Nehemiah identifies himself as the son of Hakaliah in that opening verse. I just wanted to throw that in there because when you read scripture, it's important to make note of these things. Because if not, you're assuming people are who they aren't or aren't who they are, if that makes sense. I knew you'd laugh. But we do that. So I'm going to recap before I move on, and then I'm going to point out even more positive characteristics of this man, Nehemiah. So far, we've learned that he's responsible. He's trustworthy. He's a man of prayer. He's a planner and a man of action, and he's able to identify what needs done and inspire people to join his vision. I think that's a man anybody would want to work with. I think that's a guy anybody would want to have on their team. Pretty swell guy, huh? But wait, there's more. There's always more. Nehemiah not only was able to motivate his fellow workers with his words, but also with his own example. In chapter 5, Verses 14 through 18 tell us that after being appointed governor of Judah, neither he nor his family took advantage of all the perks that went with that position, which would include the best food, the best wine, land that they could take possession of. But verse 16 of chapter 5 says, Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. Sounds to me like we can add humility to the list of positive character traits displayed by Nehemiah. He didn't need to be the big shot. He just wanted to focus on the work. He not only denied himself his own privileges, as we read in chapter 5, but he also called out the wealthy Jews who were taking advantage of their poorer countrymen. I know it just sounds like I'm heaping a lot of praise on this guy. You'd think based on what I've said that he's some kind of superhero. Listen, he's not. He's a guy. But he's a man on a mission with a passion for God's work. And he simply won't let anything get in his way. His writings show that in addition to everything else, he has the ability to overcome opposition. How many business people do you know that run into problems in business and they just fold? They just stop. They just give up. Not Nehemiah. 
over and over again, and I imagine much like the people did when Noah was building the ark, over and over again they tried to intimidate him. First they ridiculed him. You don't really think you can fix this wall. In chapter 4 it says that one person claimed that the weight of something as small as a fox would collapse this new wall they were building. So why bother? When that didn't work, they tried accusation. They said he was restoring the wall in preparation for a Jewish uprising that would ultimately end with Nehemiah as the king. He didn't get upset. Here's how he responded to that charge. Chapter 6, verse 8. I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. You're imagining things. You're twisting the facts. But there's no truth to it. Then when that didn't work, they went so far as to hire someone claiming to be a prophet to tell Nehemiah that he should fear for his life and he should run and hide and stop the work on this wall. His response, chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. How could he possibly figure that out? How could he possibly know that? Based on what had already taken place, I think he knew that God had been, God's hand had been on him, and God had been in this whole project, and God wasn't going to let anybody put a stop to it. So he knew this wasn't true. He trusted that God would allow him to finish what God had allowed him to begin. Now that's not always the case. We've all heard of ministries that start out on fire, and down the road something happens. Sometimes it's a personal downfall that leads to a ministry downfall. We wonder why some things thrive and other things don't when it comes to kingdom work. I have a theory. I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced that while, while all of the traits that are displayed by this man, Nehemiah, all played a part in his success, there are two. That without them, the others wouldn't have mattered at all. Not in this case. So here's the take home for us today, church. The first I've already talked about, it's prayer. Every time Nehemiah had a decision to make or a request to make, he prayed first. Not as a last resort, as a first resort. The other is the proper motivation. He had his reasons for wanting to rebuild the wall and the gates. He had a heart for the Jewish people. He wanted to see the Jewish people restored, their sense of pride restored, their place where they lived restored. He wanted this to all come back together. He wanted that, though, not for them, but for God. Because he recognized, if you go back and you read in the first chapter, the whole thing came about the exile and the scattering of the people came about. Why? Because they rebelled against God. We talked this morning in Sunday school about the two groups of people that existed at the time. The people of God, the people not of God. How do you think the people of God looked in the eyes of the people not of God when God scattered them everywhere because of their disobedience? To bring them back, Nehemiah's goal was to restore the relationship 
between the Jewish people and God to help restore that by bringing the people home. Because if you go back and read, God said, if you do this, I'm going to scatter you to all the nations. If you come back and repent and are obedient, I will gather you back together again. Nehemiah knew that. That's what he was working toward. The wall was merely a way to do that. A way to get people involved. He wasn't interested in the approval of others. He wasn't interested in being remembered as a great man among great men. His motivation throughout his work, throughout his ministry, was to please and serve God, period. That's all. At the very, as the very last words of this book, and at four or five other times in the book as well, Nehemiah writes these words. Remember me with favor, my God. That's all he wanted out of life. That was it. That was the goal. Church, our one and only motivation in life has to be to please and serve God. Whatever, wherever that leads us, whatever that looks like for different individuals, that has to be the goal. We do that today not by rebuilding a wall, but by rebuilding relationships. Because in a way, our goal, it's exactly the same as that of Nehemiah. He rebuilt that wall as a part in repairing God's relationship with his people. Isn't that worse, what we're supposed to be doing? Isn't that the great commission? That we help to lead people to restore their relationship with God through Christ? That's our job. That's why Christ created the church. That's the marching orders we were given. So how do we do that? Well, it obviously starts with restoring our personal relationship with God through Christ. And it continues by us loving God and loving people. The two greatest commandments. It's really not rocket science. It's really not that hard to figure out. That loving people part includes living much like Nehemiah did. Imagine a church where every single person lived with integrity and passion for God. That church will change the world again. Our cause is the gospel. And when we seek God's guidance, as Nehemiah did, we do so through the Holy Spirit. And when we follow that guidance, no matter what the world throws at us, like Nehemiah did, our ultimate reward will be God's favor. And that's all we really need. Let's pray. God, I love you so much. I thank you for your word, for the insights that we find in it, for the examples of people who lived to glorify you and to lift up your presence in the world. Father, we do that by lifting up the name of your son, Jesus. And I pray that if anyone can hear this at any point in time, and they've never taken that first step, restoring their relationship with you through Christ, that they would do that. As for the rest of us, I pray that you would use us to rebuild walls. Not walls of division, but walls of gathering together your people. Today, in this world, that's the church. And Father, I pray we would be used to draw people to you and into your family so that when the time comes, when your son returns, we would all be together in union with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said...